our passion. And we want to also thank the folks from McLaurin Baptist Church and, and Adventurers, correct? The Adventure Scouts, is that correct? Navigators. Trail, Nap, nap trail, trail Navigators. I can't remember any. But anyway, Mr. Kenneth Cram, you may have seen him on YouTube, uh, but he has graciously consented to give us a short talk. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Mr. Ken, thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. What I want to show you is how I camped when I was a kid in the 1950s. And this is classical type of camping. We, we camped, our family would spend a month in a national park in California called Yosemite, where they were bears. And our family would camp right next to where they, there was the old trash dump where they fed the bears. But at that point in time, we weren't afraid of bears particularly. So we camped on the ground. We didn't camp in tents, although our, our parents did put a little sheet around their camping area, but we kids just camped on the ground. And I have pictures of what we camped like. like this. By the way, if you look at pictures from the Civil War era, people did the same thing. And people camped like this all the way up until World War II. And, you know, my dad traveled around the world with this sort of thing. And so I was fortunate enough to grow up in a family where in the early years we camped like this. This is a bedroll. And I'm going to untie it. Would someone like to come here and help me untie it? Come on up and help me tie it. This is a bedroll, and I'll show you what it, what it actually looks like inside. Now, in the old days, this outer sheet here, this, this is a modern canvas, but what we use is we use an oil cloth because we had on our, our table a cloth that was a canvas that they put oil on, linseed oil, and that was a tablecloth. And so when my mother did it, it was her tablecloth. And so this is the modern version of a tablecloth. So what we're going to do is, let's see if I can untie these knots. And there. I'm going to try to untie these knots here. Can you pull that one right there? And everything is tied together with a string. Let's see. And all it is is a string with a little knot on the end, and it unties with a bow knot. It's really simple. So I got those two. And you know, I, I can't tie many knots, but this is just a little simple. Let's see. These are just, when you tie it around, Not supposed to come apart with you when you're camping. <laughs> so you can see this one's hard. To, I haven't opened this in two years. It's been a long time since I've camped this way. So you get to be special seeing it. Now oh, let's see. One for this string and this one. We're going to have to open this bag after we're through. Because we would go places and I would carry my bedroll this way. And I have a picture of me and my mother with the same bedroom. It's amazing. And this is the way it looks. And typically, in the top part of the bedroom, you put your pots and pans. And you put your food in that little haversack there. And so this would be your pots and pans. And we're going to open this out. Let's see. Let's see if we can open it. Let's open this bedroom. Let's turn it this way. We're going to turn it this way. And let's see, let's open it up. And here, when I have it, I left it. I always put a plastic bag in there 
Why do you think I might have a plastic bag? Any ideas? A thermal blanket, maybe? Okay, I could use it to keep the ground from getting wet. So that, that that's like a thermal blanket. What happens when it rains? Uh, if I put a hole in the top of this, I could use it as a raincoat. And so sometimes, if it were to rain, I'd take my knife, in those days we carried knives, and I could cut a little hole in the top, and I'd have a raincoat. So that, was my, that would be my emergency raincoat. And then I had, and you know what this is? Pillowcase. I'd collect pine needles, put it inside, and that would be my pillow. Then I had... What was this for? I guess to wash with. I haven't used this for a couple of years. <laughs> ah. And then, I have something very important here. This is a thin sheet of drapery material. And you know, have you ever had mosquitoes get on you? You can, instead of buying nets like you have now, we had drapery material like this that we would put over us to keep the mosquitoes from biting us. And in the 1800s, in the, in the, around the Civil War era, you would use petticoats, women's petticoats, and you would use that to keep the mosquitoes off you. And you had a big hat on, you put it over like this, that nobody would bite you. And so that was very important. You carried all of that inside. Now, let's, let's see if we can straighten this out. Let's we straighten this all out. Now you notice on the outside on the ground, I have this cloth. Now this used to be a tablecloth. And now I'm using a, a modern canvas that's waterproof. And then I would sleep in this wool blanket. And mother did something special. She sewed a sheet. Now I'm not very good at sewing, so I use safety pins. She sewed a sheet on the inside so I'd feel like I'm at home. And then I've read in books from the Civil War era that the height of luxury in the 1800s after the Civil War was to sew a sheet inside your wool blanket and it wouldn't be all itchy. It'd be like a beautiful, nice sheet. And mother did that and I was just so amazed when I discovered this came from a long time ago. Now when I was little, I used to sleep in this just like I do. Hey, you can get down here. Why don't you lie right down here? You lie right down right here and just pretend this is your bed. Okay, so you get right here in the center, you get up a little higher, your head's near the top. And imagine your mattress, you've gotten all the pine needles. And so our job when we get the camp set up, we to get the pine needles. So we had a bed six inches thick with pine needles. And then when I was little, we used to just fold this over us. And I'd be up at the top. Fold that over like this. That keep it nice and warm and comfy. And then if it were to get to rain, then I'd pull this over me. And this would keep the rain off of me. And so then I could stay dry and comfortable. And yet as a kid, I never got cold. I had no memory of anything that I had to a whole lot of summer like this on the ground without me. Now I don't know, maybe there was this one, but I don't remember it ever in those years of doing that. Now when I got older, I got too long to be in that mattress. So if you'll get up, I'll show you what I did when I got older. When I got older and I was too big, I needed to be in the mattress in the bed sideways because I'd have more length. So I got up like this 
this end a little higher and I folded it like this and then I folded one side over here notice now I have more length to keep me warm and then I folded this way and then I pull these things over me and I was in a little cocoon and even if it were to rain because this was an oil cloth that was our tablecloth the old-fashioned tablecloth and I can still remember the smell of it and this isn't the same but it's it's a, the modern version of it. You put this over you, and you were comfortable. Now, there are ticks and insects. You have to find a, a spot in the ground that's safer. And adults can figure that can help you figure that out. But this is the way we did it when I was very young, and we camped on the ground. But we didn't have hammocks. People camped in hammocks, but we didn't do it. This is the way we did it. So this is the same way that was done in the 1800s that I did as a, as a young child. And it was a lot of fun. I've done it all the way up through the last few years. And now my old body doesn't like it quite so much. The older you get, your body doesn't like it the same way. But this is, is fun. This is exactly the way I rolled it up. And again, this is the first time this has been out in a couple of years. Because now I usually sleep in the hammock over there. <laughs> but this is comfortable. And there's some things to learn from this. Is that sometimes the old ways that people did things are really, really good ways. And when you're close to nature like this, you see that everything around you is important and alive. And treat it with care and love. Because the natural world has been here all the time. And we live in houses and we've forgotten what this, this world here is like. And we're visitors in this world. And if, if you do that, you will learn to love it and respect it. And know that there's certain places you shouldn't camp like this. And other ones you can always have an adult help you so that you're safe when you, when you are, are outdoors like this. So anyway, this is how I grew up not that long ago in the 1950s. But it's the way that was done historically for many, many years. Well, thank you. You're welcome. So I've, I've enjoyed telling you about this. There, there are other things that are here. This is the haversack. And it's not that I didn't have one. I had one when I was a kid. It wasn't quite like this. This used to be uh, an East German bread sack, and it was used to have bread, and there were lots of gas masks. So this one was used for multiple purposes. But it, I would put all my food in here, and everything I would need. I put it on one side. On the other, it's in the woods, and you can still do this today. But when you do this, you need to really have someone with you so that you're safe. And because we've forgotten so much. If my parents were still alive, I'd learn so much more. There's something that you, the past has so much knowledge. And we're just trying to recapture, and that's what this bushcraft stuff's all about. Recapturing the knowledge that was, was there in the past. And there are many different ways people do things. Everybody has something different to contribute as we're all learning about. So let's let's go put this back together. Let's see. I think we can get it back together. If we have some other people help get it back together, it's all folded the same way I had it folded. Now, typically I would have put my pots and pans and stuff like that in the very middle. But let's see, this goes, what did we do? We folded this into thirds, didn't we? Let's see if we can fold it into thirds. When I was a kid, I don't remember much about it. I just knew that we, we had to do chores. One time, I remember a story one time that I must have been around eight years old. And my, I have a twin brother and an older brother. And we were all camping on the ground like this. And mother was very concerned in the morning 
because a bear had come between us and was walking over us. And we slept through the whole thing. You know that bear? You know, we were camping next to where they fed the bear. They had, that's where they used to feed the bears from the trash. But it, it didn't stop us from camping. We just still continued to camp. You just, you just learn that these are parts of things. You learn to respect them. I don't remember what we were told to do if we saw a bear. So. Memories as a kid are, are different. Okay, let's see. Can we, can we get this? Can you help me get this stuff in here? This is really neat. You don't need to buy mosquito net. Hey, hey, by the way, I've taken this. I sometimes like to pretend this is just a, an old, what are you, a curtain. Uh, I've taken ropes to the end of it, and I've used the panel to bring that to the tree. I've just tried. You can learn all sorts of stuff by the some of the books I've read, when you get to go to the country store and buy ten cents, you can use that to go to the Lots of ways. Some people put the wolf blankets on the outside. Some people, and they, they kept the tarps on the inside because they were more precious and they didn't want them torn. There were a whole bunch of different ways this was done over the years. Okay, now now what we have to do is just tie two strings around the end and put it over you and carry it wherever you want to do. The amazing thing was I found pictures of my mother wearing this. And she used to also wear kids sneakers when she was outdoors. So I got some sneakers just like hers. And I, I did a little video in memory of her a few years ago. But if, if you have any family that's ever done stuff like this, and, you sh and then you get those pictures together, that will be cherished by every family member there is. And I put two... I tie it this way, I tie the end so that the, the stuff, the pots and pans and things and little lights, sometimes you use like this little light here, I think in there, a little candle. I, tie, I put all that in, in the center. Now, what you might want to do is see how other people do it, because everybody does things sort of differently. And they... The, the twine that I'm using, I think it's hemp or something like that. Can you, can you see if you can tie one like that on that side? Then you tie the bottom together. And by the way, when you're a kid, if you do this, if it falls apart, then you put it back together and do it again. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't remember much learning about it other than I just had to carry it from where, in the old, the old car we had, we'd, we had a little, um, it was really an old car, and we had a, 
canvas bag to put water in, you know, into the front of it because we'd run out of water. I guess they called it a little Model T. Our parents used old stuff. So there's one there, and then we do one at the end. Thank you very much for helping. I appreciate it. So that's what I have with that. There, there are other things that, there are lots of things that you can do when you're outdoors. Some of them are old time, some of them are new. Just experiment and have fun. The most important thing when you're outdoors is have fun. And there's something new that I learned. And adults, how many of you know of Martha Stewart? <laughs> okay, Martha Stewart. Did you, did you ever see on television when she made a cardboard oven? You remember seeing it? Yeah. It was a box that she lined with a, with a heavy duty aluminum foil. And she said they put a number of lumps of charcoal in it to make the temperature control. And if you ever have a power failure, if you don't have an oven, you can have this perfectly good oven. You can cook on it. Now I didn't originally watch it, but my daughter did, who's in her 40s now. And she's a, she's a scout leader. And she told me about it, and I thought, oh, this is very interesting. And I looked on YouTube, and a few people had these square boxes. And I thought, how can you really use those for camping? You can't make them small. How can you really work with it? Well, when you have fun outdoors, you can try doing things different ways. This is my version of that cardboard oven. I have a smaller one. This is one of the versions. But I have smaller ones than this. And you just take corrugated cardboard, cover it with a little bit of foil, and you put glue on it, and you can rubber cement, and make sure the glue dries thoroughly, so it doesn't have a hot fire. You can put it in the You can roll that up, and you can use charcoal in a dog bowl, a couple lumps of charcoal, that's enough, or you can use a can of sterna. Uh, and it actually works. And you can cook chickens, you can cook cake, you can cook whatever you want. It, it, it's very simple. So, when you're outdoors with stuff, in the old days, people used to innovate with whatever was they had available. And, you know, we talk about we try to go back into history and we learn different ways of fire starting. And one of the first ways of fire starting, you rub sticks together and you learn how to do that. And you use flint and steel, you learn that. But you know that the folks who were the first people out here on the frontier, if there was a country store nearby and they had this new invention called matches, they, they had a different fancy name for them. I forget what they did. Somebody else will remember the name. Lucifer matches. Lucifer matches. The devil. If you had these matches, you'd go get them and you put them in your little fire safe to keep them so they, they don't don't get wet because everybody wants the easiest, simplest thing using the newest technology even back then. Even back in biblical times, you want the newest way to do things. Well, this is a new way to do things. So you might not call it bushcraft because it's not out of the bush, but it's used stuff that you can find trash in the bush that comes like this. We can all do fun things and experiment in different ways. And so one of the things that I like to play with are things like making ovens that are in different ways. So you can always learn and have fun outdoors. The most important thing is to have fun, enjoy things, enjoy where we are. Everything here has a purpose. We don't understand that purpose. That's my personal philosophy. And uh, get to know what is out here. And then more, more people are afraid of the outdoors because we live in the, in the city. But the outdoors is very, very, very safe place. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is something here. As a little side note, I'm making a, a tea from Yopan Holly leaves. Yopon holly was used by Native Americans throughout the Americas, even in places where it wasn't grown. It grows in the south. Um, Yopon holly 
It's the only plant in the Americas that has caffeine in it. And it has also antioxidants. When it was discovered by the Spaniards, it was, I think in Florida, when it was discovered in the 1600s, the Spaniards loved it. This caffeine was rare to drink. They loved it, it was shipped back to, to Spain. The Native Americans and each tribe is different in the way that it was used. Used it for ritual purposes. It was used in manhood rit rituals, that's one purpose. And vomiting was part of that, that ritual and was used for purification. <coughs> and so it's called Ilex Vomitoria, it's a Latin name. That's because the, the scientists who named this didn't understand, they thought it was all poison. Even in the Forest Service in, in Texas, they were telling you you can't touch them. They were training you can't, you can't eat the plant, it'll cause you to vomit, that, that, that. But they didn't understand that some of the stuff was lost. It, it is not poisonous at all. In fact, there, it was used during the Civil War era for leaves as a, as a coffee substitute, not because it tastes like coffee, but because it has the effects of caffeine and it keeps you alert. So anyway, it was used by one of the purpose was purity. The second use that it was used for ceremonially was uh, for friendship. When one tribe was friends with another, it was used in friendship ceremonies. It was used in friendship ceremonies with the Spaniards, the early explorers. And the notes were kept by these so-called friends. And I say this because when you read it, it's a little bit bothersome. And they were actually spies so that they could deal with getting rid of the, moving the, the native people from where they were. And so it was used for friendship. Uh, and then I said, purity, and the third, you know, the second one is friendship, purity, and peace. Because when you drink the, the tea in, in that ceremonial situation, you drink it and it was representing peace. So peace, purity, and friendship are what it recommend, re represented. I have a little bit I've written about it here on the videos on this topic. I've collected some. If we had some growing right here, I'd be doing it the way that they did it in the ceremonies as it, they appear to be. Most, most tribes are all different. Um, they take the leaves and put them in the fire until they turn brown and then they cooked it for a long time and it was a black drink. And the exact recipe varied by place to place. It was highly traded, highly valuable. And in fact, it is recently known is you can look at the pottery from all over the North America, including Alaska, you'll find traces of the caffeine from this drink in that pottery. So we trade it all over, highly valuable, highly ritual, and it grows in the South. And it's very important. It's one of many pieces of knowledge that hasn't been fully understood. And they're still researching a huge amount about it. But I love all of that stuff. I think yes, that's enough. Yeah. Unless you want to know about this. Yeah. Well, everybody knows about that and that. Those pots and pans, my friend. No, no, no. Oh, but well, you got something special and rare. No, no, no. Oh, that's Come what on. we... That's you know, what we... You know what this is? No, someone else tell me what American Jimmy Bear is. Tell me about the American Jimmy Bear. Anybody else tell me about it? Jimmy Bear's and Phil. Bugs and Phil. Edible. Mary. It's a poo-poo it's a wiper. <laughs> How do you use it as a bucket? <laughs> and the, That's what the it is. Settlers were put it under their horses. And I put it under my hand. We also burned the fire. During the fire, I did that too. Works very well. It's being studied, although it's been used, it's for what it's safe for people. But it's natural. I grow it every place around me. You don't need to buy mosquito plants to be selling them. And then the berries, the purple berries, beautiful purple berries. It's at the end of the season right now. They're sweet. They taste a little bit mealy, particularly when they're this old. I dry them and use it for tea year round. Uh, the uh, settlers, would use this to make jelly, among other things. But there's lots of plants that do things. 
I wouldn't recommend eating it <laughs> unless you know how you're going to respond and somebody's just telling you this. I don't have any problem with These are a little on the old side. I'm going to put it in the. I'm, I'm making some banana bread. I'm going to put it in the banana bread. But I decided I'd only use modern ingredients. How do you like it? Kind of That's not bad. Bad. Yeah. Not bad at all. I like it. I didn't like it either. I did. Younger is better. They used to bake it into bannock. Remember the first time somebody made it and said, I found these berries and I thought they were glittering in it. They were about to die, but they lived through it. Yeah. Well, the bright colors are often dangerous. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the secret is when you go into a new land and you're not sure, you always travel with a companion that's dumb enough to eat whatever you cook. <laughs> that's how you find out. Now, sometimes there are little insects in it, but I just eat them along with it. Protein. Uh, Protein. Uh, Give me some more. This, I just collected this out here. There's a volunteer. Uh -uh. No, no, no. <laughs> now, just, just for your kids. <laughs> Do not go out in the forest and eat stuff, not unless somebody who you really trust, like your parents. <laughs> not the kid from down the block. Or, yeah, not the kid from down the block, because sometimes there's things that don't look, that look similar, but you don't want to eat them. Anyway, that's it now. sign in so you can get your number for the drawing tonight. Plus the history of everybody that tends to lose. Mr. Ken, thank you, sir. That was awesome. Yeah. Guys, we got one more speaker for you. This is Mr. Blackie Thomas with Shaman's Forge Bushcraft, also a very popular YouTube channel. And he's going to come up here and Say a few things, teach a few things, and uh, let's see what you got, Black. Okay. Give him applause, y'all. Hiya. Okay. Like I said, my name is Blackie Thomas. Actually, my name, get ready for this, is Michael Carlton Young Lusa Thomas. Try getting all them letters in first grade right. My grandfather called me Little Blackbird, and that got shortened down to Blackie. So everybody's want to know where did Blackie come from? That's where you get Blackie from. Okay. Now, one thing I want to talk about was just a few little tips or tricks. Now, a knot that I have found hugely useful, and it's one of the things where you learn something and you don't know the specific name of it, but you use it. You know, many many years ago when I was coming up. Most of the men in my family had been in the military. Most of them had been in World War II, Korea, and it was the early Vietnam era. And so most of my gear that I got to play in the woods with was old surplus. So I had army sleeping bags, I had army shirts, army boots, K-bar knives, that's what we had. And we weren't going and playing in the woods because, you know, it's something that we do. We did it because we were hunting. You were gathering. Uh, my family, when I was a, up to the time I was a teenager, it was Friday night at the dinner table when Dad said, we're going hunting tomorrow, all of us boys went, oh, God, no. Because hunting meant we're going to be getting up at 3.30 in the morning, you're going to be in a deer stand before 4, and you're going to sit there till 9 o'clock with a rifle. Then at 9 o'clock, someone yells, normally this, hoo that traveled for miles. And we'd all come down, and then we'd go to the truck, and the rifles got put in the truck, and you'd whoop down some crackers or something, and out would come the shotguns. And it wouldn't be just five or six of us, it's 30 or 40 of us. And we'd form a line and go through that, 10 feet apart like a military unit. 
the little boys that were too big for guns, five or six, they toted croaker sacks. If it's brown, it's down. You shoot deer, you shoot bird, you shoot squirrel, you shoot whatever. If it's edible, you shoot it. And the kids took it back for cleaning, etc. About two o'clock, we'd come out and you'd actually eat lunch, maybe get a 45 minute nap. And then it was time to go back and sit in the deer stand with your rifle up until about six o'clock. And then those that got picked, and I always got picked, got to go sit on the creek bank and run trot lines till six o'clock in the morning. So it would be two o'clock Sunday before I got to go to bed. So you can understand when daddy said, we're going hunting or playing in the woods, you went, oh, God. here we go. It was an advantage and I, the skills that I was, it was passed on to me. But it was a, when you're a teenager at my, at that age, you thought it was a disadvantage. You know, all your friends are talking about the new car, the new motorcycle, the new whatever. You're talking about, yeah, I'm getting new rifles for Christmas. Because it was a tool, you know. We did that type of stuff. Well, there was this knot, and I know the first time I ever seen it was on a U.S. Army sleeping bag. And it was a loop like that. And you pulled it, and it got tight. And it wouldn't come loose until you grabbed the little tab, which was the unlocker. And then you'd pull it, and that allowed it to slide back loose. Now, today I know this name is a Canadian jam knot. I didn't know what that was back in them days. We called it the sleeping bag knot, because everybody used it to hold their sleeping bags. But this is one of the most useful knots that I know of in bushcraft, because what I call this is bushcraft zip tie. I need to bind this up. I run around and go, Zip! and I can let go. I'm done, no knot. All I gotta do to tie it or untie it is just bring this loop loose. For those of you that don't know, you put a knot in the end, I double knot it, then you come down an inch or so and you put a second knot. Now you just do a simple overhand back to the loop, and then you take the running end you're going to go around your topic, and you're going to come through so that it's exactly the same as the piece you just put through. It's going the same way. It's not going the opposite. Now when you pull it tight, it's going to bind between those two knots. And when I pull this up nice and blood tight, these two knots right here slide together. And when they do, they lock. So I can yank, and it'll hold my weight. It ain't coming loose. At the same time, I can get it off even if it's been rained on, pulled on, stressed on, whatever, by grabbing that lock tab and pulling, and that breaks the knot, and that slides again, so I can slide it off. Now, you know when you're doing work with paracord, you always end up with them oddball link pieces? This is what I do with my oddball link pieces. I make this. I have like five or six of them already set up in a loop in my haversack. And then the rest, I'm on a daisy chain. Now, all that is, is I'm gonna take it, leaving that tab, you're going to go around and make a loop. You're going to come up and you're going to make another loop going through it. Pull it down tight. Pull down the slack. Make another loop, go through that loop. And you just start shrinking this thing down in size. It thickens it up and it makes it a unit. I'll show you this in a second when I get it done. This is a fairly long one. But I keep these in the front of my haversack for quick grab. When I need to secure a piece of gear to a tree, I need to tie a pack up, I need to whatever. So I'm gonna put up a tripod real quick. All I do is just cut three sticks the right length, put it across the top, zip, and I got a tripod. It won't melt unless I build a big fire under it. And by just quickly doing what I'm doing right here, I can take any size length cord I need and reduce it down in size. And when you get to the very last knot, it'll look like that. Now, that's what I put in my haversack. The length of this tells me roughly how long it is. One that long might be a ridge line. That long will be a, a serious ridge line. But I can pull this out, this doesn't tangle up, grab that end and go, and I'm ready to go again. Real quick and easy. One of the most useful pieces of gear I got in my pack, and I use these for everything, it seems like. Now, I also carry bank line, and I'll make some of these out of bank line as well. But the advantage to this is, this is the knot that I'm gonna tie and it's not permanent. I'm gonna secure this piece of gear. I'm gonna tie something like this up, zip, and I can let go, it's done. And I know no matter what, I can get it out. Because when you're really out here and you're doing this stuff, 
it's hot, it's been stressed, it's rained, it's dried, it's rained again, it's stressed, whatever, and then you go to untie that knot and it's like iron. You're sitting there trying to pick it apart and you've got a headache and you need to get into this pack right now and it's just a pain. This, you grab that lock knot and pull. It's off. Quick and simple. Now a variation that I made of that, I'm not going to say I invented it because I guarantee you in bushcraft, you can say I invented X and somebody will find a piece of paperwork shows you where somebody in 1910, 1800, they already done it once. All we're doing is reinventing the wheel. But what I call this was a woodsman's Proust knot. Now you know what a Proust knot is, is you've got a, a, a line, we're going to put up a tarp and you've got a line, you got a loop, and you go up to it and you pass it through that loop three times, just like that, roll it down there. So it's all cinched up and it makes a knot that you can slide but once it's under tension it locks into position and don't slide well that's a great thing to have for a tarp because i've got my ridge line up now i got an adjustable this way but i still gotta tie it to the tarp no i don't like i was saying with them old woodsmen i remember seeing this when i was a boy but didn't know what i was looking at and didn't know enough to ask but it was one of them things that I saw many of the old woodsmen and hunters in my family, how they had secure a tarp down to a truck or hook a dog box in or things like that. On the other end of it, they've tied, I've tied a T-toggle and all that is is a series of knots going one way and then I jump over and come back so it's in the middle. Now I want to, I've put my Proust, I'll leave this Proust hanging on a ridge line. So when I pull my ridge line out, it's got two of them on it. I go through, anchor, pull it tight, truckers hitch it, pull it off, blood tight. There's my ridge line, and hanging off of it is two of these. All I gotta do is take the corner of my tarp, come up, I make a loop, go through the grommet, and then I take that toggle and stick it through. Just like that. It won't pull through. So now I have a tarp that I can angle slide to any position I want on it and be able to get it on and off without any knots involved. That's quick. That's easy. It makes it very simple for me, especially when you're out and you're doing this stuff for fun or etc. You got a lot of people talking to you or you got a lot of kids you're working with, scouts or something like that. And I just need to get a tarp up. And you got that 30 mile an hour wind and you're trying to put a tarp and the minute you pull it up you know what's going to happen. It's all over the place. And so having a ridge line, it's already got an anchor point. But I ain't got to sit and hold it tight. I come up, make a loop, stick it through, and dunk. And I can let go of it. It ain't going to come off that line. I go to the other one. Now I can adjust it tight and slide the tarp wherever I need to do up and down the line. My guidelines that I've done for the end are the same way. I took bank line and I tied a toggle like that in the end of them so I can come through and make that connection. Now I can take it one on and off without any knots. Just quick and easy. In bushcraft, which I don't like the term bushcraft. I understand where it comes from. Really it was popularized in the 50s and all by a gentleman who wrote a book about the Bushmen of Australia. And they're called Bushmen. And he had been a survival expert for the Australian Army. It became popular and people started doing bushcraft. When I was a boy it was woodscraft and it was woodsman. That's what it meant. When you had the handle of a woodsman, it meant somebody that you could turn loose, they could go out there and they could take care of themselves. You didn't have to worry about them. Maybe they could get turned around, but they knew how to survive. Like the old song says, a country boy can survive. Well, they could. They could take care of themselves and they took care of their family living in the woods. Now, quite often these were gentlemen who were loggers, you know, uh, hunters, fishermen, market hunters, I had a great uncle that up until the 1970s, he still went out and shot deer for people. Now that's illegal in the state of Alabama now. Back then, you would tell him I need four deer in my freezer this year and he'd provide you four deer. You know, he was a hunter. He got hundreds of deer legally, legal season, but he would go out and hunt deer. And he lived in the woods. His entire kit would fit into a little bitty backpack. And he'd be gone for 10 
10 days at a time. The only time he came out was with me. He'd score a deer, he'd bring it out, he'd take it to his daddy's house, his uncle would take it, bring it to you and say, here's your deer, and he'd turn around and go back in the woods. He would live in the woods a month at a time, 10 days to a month. How I would love to spend two weeks with that gentleman today, but I didn't know what it was back then. Our skills are being lost. Our skills are slowly dying away. The good news is there's people like you that have started paying attention again. And the great thing is we got internet now, and we've got YouTube. And so you know how to do this with a Dutch oven, and he knows how to do this with such and such, and he knows, and we can share in the greater community. Like the gentleman was talking a while ago, all he did was do a search, and there it was on YouTube. We've got the greatest opportunity right now to learn these skills. I hope that what I've showed you is useful. If you got any questions, please walk up and talk to me. Thank you, guys. That's it for me. Like yes, sir. Mr. Homer Mayo, thank you guys for taking a few minutes to listen. Mr. Homer Mayo is going to be doing a little cooking demo if you're interested in watching that. And it's going to take a, a little while to, you know, for this to cook. But it is uh, a sausage chicken uh, jambalaya, right? So anyway, I do want to thank uh, you guys, you young scouts, for coming out and indulging a few of us old folks and. Uh, I just want you to realize something that exactly what Mr. Blackie said. These skills and techniques are dying quickly. They don't need to. And because of fine young men like you, these things can keep going on. And that you can in turn pass these things on to your children. I encourage you to embrace what your leaders are trying to teach you because of telling you. The woods is a blast. It, it it's, it's the place to be, okay? So thank you guys for coming out. We appreciate you. <laughs> Remember, if you came here for the booth, not to exclude the Boy Scouts, but this is just a history for the booth, please come see me to sign this so that you'll have a number for tonight's phone. Plus, it gives us a record of how many people came. It's just a kind of